Okay, good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, the Barbara Rabin Chief Education Officer here at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, and I would like to welcome you to our final 2022 Spring Break Survivor Speaker Series speaker. That's a mouthful. So today you will hear from Julie Mittal Berman, who is a daughter of survivors Magda and Les Middleman. Magda and Les were both born in Hungary. During the war, Les was conscripted into forced labor by his fellow Hungarians for the Hungarian army on the Eastern Front, but he ultimately escaped and joined a partisan group, a resistance group. Magda and her family were confined to a ghetto before being sent to Auschwitz concentration camp. She was ultimately liberated in Germany. Before we begin, I would like to thank our community partners for the Spring Break Speaker Series, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Lone Star, Congregation Tiferet Israel, Girl Scouts of Northeast Texas, Human Rights Campaign Dallas-Fort Worth, Jewish Family Service of Greater Dallas, Legacy Senior Communities, Temple Shalom, and Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. And by the way, you know you're getting old when you have to hold the paper out, never mind. We are grateful for your support of the museum and our programs, and it's with your assistance that we're able to bring wonderful programs like these to the public. I would like to extend a special welcome to our board members, members and volunteers in the audience. We couldn't fulfill our mission without you. If you are interested in becoming a member, or a volunteer, please do visit our website at dhhrm.org to learn more. In just a minute, Julie will share her story with you, and it's not really her story, it's her parents' love story. Then we will have time for questions and answers. If you are joining us in person today, you can use the card provided to you at check-in to write out your answers, excuse me, your questions, not your answers. I hope you don't have answers yet. Um, our staff will come around at the end of the program to collect your cards. If you are joining us virtually, please use the Q&A function that's down at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions. It is now my tremendous pleasure to turn things over to Julie Mittal Berman. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Um, like Sarah said, my name is Julie Mittal Berman, and uh, I'm here to tell you a story. It's a love story of some sort. So both of my parents are Holocaust survivors, and since I'm their daughter, that makes me the second generation of survivors. So both of my parents came from Hungary. This, these are them, my mother, Magda, and my father, Les. And the picture in the middle that you're seeing is on their wedding day in 1945. So Hungary is in Eastern Europe. It's a fairly small country compared to some of the other ones like Poland and Germany. And as you can see on the map, it's completely surrounded by other countries. So getting away is very difficult. Just as we're seeing today with the Ukraine, uh, it's, it's tough to get out from those borders because they're completely surrounded. They can't just board a, uh, a ship in the port. It, it's hard to get out from the borders, especially when they're occupied by the enemy. So life before the Holocaust, on my mom's side, was pretty normal. They weren't wealthy, they were fairly poor. Both my grandparents had to work. My grandmother was a seamstress and she made dresses for people. And my grandfather was a salesman, so he traveled quite a bit. 
The picture in the middle is that of my mom and her older sister. And the picture on the right is of the family at a wedding um, in 1939, probably one of the last pictures that was taken of the entire family before the war broke out. My mom's side of the family was not very religious, but they would go to synagogue on high holidays, on the holy days. My mom went to public school, and that's her class picture. Um, when she was 16 years old. My father's side of the family was probably a little bit more middle class. My grandfather had his own business. He made furniture. And many times after school, my father would go and work with him and learn the trade. My grandmother was a stay-at-home mom, and she had three boys and a girl to take care of, so that was a busy job. They were a little bit more religious than my mom's side of the family, so my father went to religious school, and that's his class picture. And you can see him, he's the one with the red circle around him, he was kind of a little runt. And he sang in the synagogue choir, but many times he would skip, uh, practice because he preferred playing soccer. So then in 1939, Germany invaded Poland and the war began. Hungary was not part of the war yet, but they were sympathetic to the Germans. They were on the German side, so they didn't actually start fighting with them, but they were on their side. So the first order that came from the government was that all men over the age of 18, had to enlist into the military. And soon after that, all the men who were Jewish had to start wearing a yellow armband so they can tell them apart. And soon after, after that, the men who were Jewish with the yellow armbands were formed into work battalions. These were slave labor battalions because at that point, they could not have any communications anymore with their families. They couldn't go home. They couldn't get any mail from them. They were grouped together and taken all over Hungary to do hard labor. And what they were doing is they were getting ready for the Nazis at some point to come into Hungary and take over. So they took them all over to build barracks, build camps, um, do all the hard labor, labor that needed to be done in preparation. So one of the first places that my father was taken to was the small little town called Solnok, where my mom was. That's where the love story begins. So now you're going to get to meet my father, and he's going to tell you about his time there in Sol Solnok. Well, uh, they sometimes, you know, uh, where we were, we were housing, they was a elementary school. And she had a friend maybe two blocks further. And they knew in the city a lot of Jewish boys there. So the Jewish girls, they came to visiting there. They sing, you need something, we can bring you, etc. There I met with her. And uh, I was there about 10 months in Solnok. And... Uh, uh, that's the place was, which is the most comfortable was because I get a very good friend, one of the Hungarian sergeant, who knows I, I met with the girl and I want to go to visiting her. And sometimes he take me out from the camp to take me to, to let me go there and he picked me up later to go take back to the camp. So even though Hungary was not yet in the war, anti-Semitism was really, really bad. I'm assuming everybody knows what anti-Semitism is. So that's where, where people of a certain faith, of the Jewish faith, were being constantly attacked and ridiculed and life was very difficult for them. So now in the next video, you're going to hear my mom, who's going to talk about how she had to start wearing the yellow star. They, they, we get at the 
the yellow stars. We had a the we had to wear the yellow stars on we can go out on the street. My mother, everybody had to make bikes like by herself. So my mother did it and I was putting on, on my coat, on my dress also because I had a job and I went to work with my, you know, with the yellow star. So, like my father said, after 10 months, he and his unit, his group of, of uh, battalion workers, were shipped out and they were sent to the Russian front. So the Russian front was the border between Russia, or at that time the Soviet Union, and, and Poland. And so he was sent up there with his unit, and that was the first time that he actually came in contact with the Germans. So now he's gonna tell you how that went. And there we get a German. And those Germans, they were taking us to they, next to their barrack, and they used us for putting down mines. They signed up an area where we had to put mines there. They show, show, how, show us how to put, or cleaning mines. The first day experience what we had, the two boy blow up on that minefield, what they put them up. They didn't do that right, they were careless and step on the mine what the another one put it down because they didn't mark them. So here I'm very fortunate to have a couple of pictures of my father in his, with his Hungarian battalion on the Russian front. And you can see they're all wearing Hungarian army uniform. And you can also see the yellow armband on them, which tells you that they're Jewish. So as they're going all along the Russian front, putting down these landmines, one of the German supply wagons breaks down. And the German in charge found out that uh, my father knew how to build things because he used to help his father in his furniture shop. So he said to my father, I'm going to send you over to the next little town. And he was either in the Ukraine or in uh, Belarus. And I'm going to send you over there and have you repair it. So my father was sent off to the next little town. And he walked into this. Uh, blacksmith's shop and when the old man who owned the blacksmith's shop looked at my father he started crying he started bawling he's crying my father said why are you crying and the man said because you look so much like my son you remind me of my son and I haven't seen my son in three years I don't know if he's dead or alive he said the Russian army came in here and they took him away and I haven't heard from him since. He said, you come in here and sit down. I'll bring you some food and some drinks, and I'll do the repair work for you, which was great. My father hadn't had a good meal in almost a year. And so the old man did the repair work for him. And before he sent him back to his unit, he said, come here. I want to show you something. And he took him to the front door. And he pointed out and he said, you see there in the middle of the, of the city, in the middle of the street down there, there's a hill. He said, you see that? He said, 7,000 Jews were brought there. They were made to the Gedich. They were all shot and killed and buried there. He said, the Germans, with the help of the locals, rounded them all up and shot them and buried them right there. He said that hill did not stop moving for days. He said that hill will be here as a reminder forever how the locals who were neighbors with these Jewish people turned them into the Nazis and how they were all killed. So by now it was 1944 
and now Hungary actually joined the war. They became part of the Nazi campaign. So the first order that came was that everybody, all the Jewish people had to go to the ghetto. So the ghetto could have been a building, it could have been a neighborhood, it could have been a city block. Depending on how many Jews lived in that town depended on what the ghetto would be. So since Solnok was, was such a small little town, the ghetto be, was the schoolhouse, the school building. And here in this picture you can see how the the uh, first on the right, you can see a Hungarian policeman standing there as people are moving things in. You can see the smile on his face. He's pretty pleased with what's going on. And then you can see how it's being boarded up. So once you're in the ghetto, you can't go out anymore. You can't go to work, you can't go to school, you can't go get food and supplies for your family and you're crammed into this building. You and everybody else in the community are all packed in there. So now you're gonna hear from my mom who's gonna talk about the ghetto. But first, she's gonna talk about how she met a German who tried to help her and why she didn't just leave. First, that there we go. he was in Romania, and he saw how these Germans, they, I mean, they people, they picking up children on people on the street, from the street, throwing up on a truck, and they just taking it. And he told they will happen here too. Don't stay here. Go away from here. Where to go? Now where to go? And he told me that he is he's giving me a uh, address in Ber Berlin. And he told go to Berlin. And I give you an address where to go. And I told him I'm not going. I am not leaving my parents. I am going where my parents will go. And then one nice day there came two policemen and I told you have to pick up all uh, these you trees, not too many things, because you are going to the ghetto. So we picked up some bad side, you know, bad things, uh, a pillow and a comforter or, and a and couple of things, dish, and on a little, buggy and, and we just pull up in the ghetto. So after they were in the ghetto for a few weeks, another order came from the government that said, you're going to be deported. You're gonna be sent away. So here in these pictures, you can see how people are being led down through the middle of the town I'm sure there's a policeman or a German leading them to the train station. But what do you see on the side there, on the side of the street? People are standing there watching. They're just watching as this entire community, their neighbors, their school friends, people who used to shop with them, people they've known all of their lives, they're just standing there watching. They're being bystanders. I'm not Jewish. Okay. And here in the other picture, you can see they're all at the train station. And you can see the confused looks on their faces. They don't know what's happening. They're not told where they're being sent to. All they know is that they're going to be getting on that train. So in the next video, my mom's going to talk about the deportation. And she's going to call the train wagons. Some people call them boxcars. Other people call them cattle cars. She calls them wagons.
or nobody was selling fast anything. And we were going with the second transport. The first transport went in Vienna. We didn't know that. The second transport went to Auschwitz. We didn't know where we were going. And we was in the, in the train on this day and, and on the way to Auschwitz. Were there other people on the train? Oh, and the train was full. On the train was full with people. We hardly can sit down. How old were you? So I was 20. Well, they were rushing up us to the second, to the wagons. They was, they was even pushing us up on the, on the, on the wagon. Who was pushing and you? The Germans. And uh, there was, uh, we was about in this, in this way, in this wagon. I mean, there was about five, which one going or maybe more. Uh, there, we was about a hundred people in this wagon, and uh, there was also an old man on the other side, in a wheelchair. They was putting on with the wheelchair, and uh, we start to go. We didn't know where we going, but uh, we just moved out, and we was about three days on the on the road, was going, when we saw. A chimney, two big chimney in the in the distance, and they was burning. They was the flame was high up on the sky, and my mother told us that well, I don't know where we going, but you get ready that maybe we going right in the flame, and uh, I don't know why, but I just didn't feel it anything anything. I saw the flame. I didn't feel anything. And then we was, we was, uh, we went closer to the place. Then we, we smelled the flesh, the burning flesh. And uh, finally the train pulled in and stopped. So in less than two months, Hungary deported 700,000 Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz. Out of those 700,000, 460,000 were murdered as soon as they got there, right away. So that's a huge number to really wrap your head around. So let's say there was 20 people sitting here in the front, that would mean that 15 of them would have been killed as soon as they got there. So now she arrived in Auschwitz, and here you can see how the train had just pulled in. You can see it there. You can see the smoke. You can see the entrance to Auschwitz right there, and you can see the people who had come off the train, and they're all running around trying to find family members, trying to figure out what's going on. And you can see the German soldiers in the front. You can almost hear them barking orders at them to get organized. And on the right, you can see they're a little bit more organized. On the one side, all the men, and on the other side, all the women. Notice how many more women there are than men. That's because, remember I told you, all the men over the age of 18 had been enlisted into the, into the work groups, work battalions. So the only ones that were left were, the, were either too old or too young to be of any use. So now in the next video, my mom is going to talk to you about the arrival. There was all my relatives, and I was waiting until they come down. And then I looked in, and I saw the door open on the other side. And there was the flame, and the soldier who was opened the door they pushed down the wheelchair with the old man. And then I was running after my mother, and we drove us. It was dark. It was evening. It was raining. And my mother picked some towels, and we put on the head, and we started to going. When I looked back on the men's 
just still was standing there in the, in the you know, court like my father outside. But we went, when we went, it was light because all the reflectors was on. On the, I saw when we sat up, there was a, a hill of baby shoes. And right beside it, there was an older hill with eyeglasses. And I told to my mother, there we are going. And they, from distance, there was a, a fence, and the woman was standing there and hollering that, give the babies to the mother, give the babies to your grandmother or your mother. But they, they was still, you know, hollering to us. And we take this part and we went to a bus house. And then we went through all this cleaning of the hair on the body, on the whole body. Well, they was coming also behind us to the same place. But when we, when we started to go, I was looking back. He was still standing there on the first lane in the, in the men's section and on. I saw my father, he was, he was looking so sad and so poor with this long winter coat on her, uh, on him. And I just wanted so much to go back to tell him a goodbye. But they was rushing us and we went in in this, in this bath house and they cleaned of us and then after the, the cutting of the hair, we went to the shower and when we came out from the shower, they gave us some rags to, to wear at each one. One of them was this short, the other was this long, so we was trying to change him. So when we came out in a bigger, big, big room, there was the men's already. But very few men was came back from the shower. There was there wasn't more than a dozen. So there wasn't more than a dozen men that came back from the, the shower. So you understand that the showers, when they went in, you never knew what was going to happen. You could go in and it would be water and you would be like a, in a shower, or you would go in and it would be gas and everybody inside that shower would be killed. So one of the other things that I wanted to mention is that they, as they came into Auschwitz, and my mom said they were on the train for three days, that meant for three days the train was moving. It didn't stop. There was no, uh, no rest stop. There was no food. There was no water. There were no facilities. So for three days on this train, several people died. Several people passed out and they didn't even have enough room to stand in one place. So now my mom was in Auschwitz, and here in the picture on the right, you can see the conditions. They were in these barracks and sleeping on these wooden bunks. Some people sleeping on the floor because they were very crowded. And you can see there's nothing there to make their life more comfortable. There's no mattress. There's no pillow, there's no comforters, there's nothing that makes it at all comfortable. And on the picture on the right, you see a group of women who look fairly young. Their heads are shaven off, like my mom said, they got shaved, shaved all the hair off. And they're wearing some kind of a uniform. So these women had just come through a, a selection. And since they're young, they probably can work. And so in the next video, my mom's going to talk to you about the selections. The selection, we went out on the, there was a big plot, big place before, you know, the, right in the entrance, and they was taking at us, and uh, naked. And then I saw first time Mengele, Dr. Mengele, 
and uh, she he was selecting he selected out my my cousin first and uh, she went on and then couple of weeks later they tried to do it to hurt us on the holidays they always selection there was always selection on every selection Mengele showed up the second selection was about in in uh, and then they selected me and uh, we were sitting there on the on the uh, plots upper uh, plots they called and uh, waiting for uh, you know to go you know they take it to the to the or in the in the shower or right to the patient but usually they give it some normal dress before you know they send it to a transport so but we were sitting there on the front of the you know entrance and and was waiting there and i was thinking about my mother that i leave my mother and my sister and my younger sister i always feel she she was always very very thin and my mother always worried about her and i just i was worried too and i didn't want her to leave them and then i just jumped up and i started to running and there was a, a, a German soldier who was a, a priest in civil and sh a bunch of women around him and listening, you know, his uh, predication. And, and then I just crawled in, in the middle. Okay. And then saw the, the post who, who was after me. He lost me. So I went back to my mother and sister and we was there until Yom Kippur and there was an order selection and they, they selected my sister and then I was, I was smarter because I tried to hide him and, uh, and they selected my sister and my sister was went, my sister was gone. Later, you know, they was making a selection again and I was every selection I was hiding and I never I never was in my mind that they will select old people or not young people because until this time they always was selecting the young people who they take at work here and there and everywhere and this time I was I was hiding on my mother was on the selection when I came back I find out that my mother is not there I was running out on the street and I saw my mother is marching you know marching there with a, a, a bunch of women they all has a white hair and I started to running after her and hollering her but in I don't know he didn't hear me and I was keep running on the on the block Alteste, you know, who was responsible for everybody. He was she was running after me and she was trying to find down me. And she told you have to come back and don't worry about the people. Don't worry about my mother where where she went. Then then she was telling me that she was taking she by herself was taking her mother to the gas chamber and I it wasn't felt me better, I tell you the truth. So now my, my mom was alone in Auschwitz, her mom gone and her sister and her cousin. But a few months later, the Germans decided to move two trainfuls of people to Germany, to another camp called Bergen-Belsen. And the reason was, was that the Russians were starting to come over that border, and they were afraid that Auschwitz was going to be liberated. 
So remember, we are already in 1940, late 44, 45. So the Russians are starting to come over the border, and my mom was sent to Bergen-Belsen, which is in Germany. And when she got to Bergen-Belsen, she found that the conditions there were even worse than in Auschwitz, if you can imagine. There was hardly any food, people were dying all over, and there, were, there was no sanitation of any sorts. But soon after she got there, again, the Germans decided to move them again, because now the British are coming from the west. So the Russians are starting to come from the east, the British are coming from the west, and the Americans are coming from the south. And so they were afraid that Bergen-Belsen would be taken over by the Brits. So they started to move them. But this time, they can't put them on a train because the trains were targets to be bombed. So they decided to walk them. So these walks, or these marches, were called death marches. And they were made to walk through Germany, going deeper and deeper into Germany, trying to get them to another concentration camp or to another camp where they could be killed. So we're going to leave my mom there now, and now we're going to go back to my father. Remember where we left him before? He was somewhere along the Russian front putting down landmines. And as I said, the Russians are starting to come over that border, so the Germans decided to move back into Poland with this unit. And as they're going, again, one of their supply wagons breaks down. And the German in charge tells my father, pick a couple of guys and you, you three stay here and repair the, the wagon. And when you're done, you come and follow us. And he left. He wanted to get the heck out of there because now the Russians are really coming. So they left. And once they were out of sight, my father looked at his friends and he said, I'm not an idiot, I'm not going. So he and his buddies took off and they ran off into a nearby forest. And when they got in there, they came across a group of people who said that they were partisans, resistance fighters. And they said, if you wanna join us, you can join us. What we do is we go out mostly at night and we'll do whatever we can to keep the Germans back, we'll sabotage We'll blow up their bridges, we'll blow up their tunnels, we'll steal their supplies, we'll, we'll try to bomb them, do whatever we can to keep them back and allow time for the Americans, the British and the Russians to come in here and liberate Poland. So my father joined. And what he found was that there were people there who were Jewish, they were Polish, they were Russians, they were men, they were women, they were Catholics, Jewish, Protestants, anybody who wanted to fight was allowed to join. So as the Russians are getting closer to Warsaw, Warsaw is one of the biggest cities in, in Poland, my father and his buddies were there trying to keep the Germans back and allow time for the Russians to come in. This was called the, the Warsaw Uprising, not the ghetto uprising, but the Warsaw Uprising. My father and his buddies were there. So now he's going to tell you what happened. The, Russia, the Warsaw was on the German occupation. Germans, they were there. The ghetto was burned already. And uh, they knew it. It's, uh, we had to go in because the Russian getting close to the river and the uh, mother side Wisla, that was the name of the river which is cut at Warsaw hair. One side, uh, that was name of the river Wisla. One side was Warsaw city, on the other side was some suburb or that one. So they expected there the Russian. We was planning to stay there on opposite side, the German side, you know, to anything what we can destroy there. We were 18 people there. And uh, we were hiding daytime in the houses, and evening we went out. The second evening, I was together with one of my friends, and uh, the big guy, and uh, 
with another with uh, Smith, and uh, we was playing with the machine gun. We was set up with the machine gun, and the German patrol who came around there, and uh, that's what we were holding them up, and. Uh, we had to move back because they were coming up, the Germans, with the tanks. So we, f we moved back about five miles from there, about five miles, about an hour, hour and a half walk back in the forest so not to find us. And there they had a s some small place building, some kind of, of storage, something. We put them there to, to sit there during the daytime. The Germans, they know they have groups there around that city, which is guerrilla groups, and they want to get rid of it. And the German airplane, Germans took us, they came at daytime looking at us. And they find that building because he turned back, and we, when we saw his turn back, we jump out from the building and some ditches closed there, we lay down there. They started to hit bomb, uh, bombing that building and they shooting machine gun. So that building, what we had, I just started, we went there when we got there to sleeping there. I took off everything, just the pants in the shirt I had there. And there I had the watch in my pocket that I get from my girlfriend when I met with her in Sona before we left. He gave me a silver watch, a flat one, but they were wearing in the small pocket. I left there, so the watch is burned there with my everything else. And uh, we were lucky because we got away without any scratch. But the German gone, and we went, tried to go back to the unit. So we got back to the basic unit, and the third day we went back to the Warsaw again because every night a different group went there. So the third night was our tour our sh to go there. So I went there, we were sitting on the top of the storage place, a higher place, we were sitting there. And the Germans, they were patrolling, and they show us up there on the hill, on the top of the building, and they started shooting us. And we was replying there, and I was, in the machine gun, and Sam, he was with me, with the belt, which is the heavy dead, you know, they call them, and the bullet to get into the, the gun. And a minute I said, Sam, I don't get supply. I stuck. What are you doing? I look and get Sam. Sam, Sam had no head. They cut. With, with, you know, they were shooting them with the machine guns, and uh, I don't know, they, 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 with some kind of uh, grenades, and the, probably that one of them cut his head. Just he had no hair right next to me. Oh my God, I said, I had full bloody. And behind the building was my friend who was preparing the belt with the bullet. I said to, to him, Reisner, uh, let's go from here because uh, the gun is gone. We have no way where to stay here. <coughs> and we tried to go, getting darker that day. We tried to go next to the building. We were laying down behind them. And we know we had a plan to 10 o'clock evening to get to one spot where we're supposed to get together to moving back further. And uh, evening at the evening, I said, no, Right, we have to move. So we started to going slowly, and they were shoot up those uh, candles, like with the air, the shooting up candles, which is coming back down with the parachute, and they light up the whole area. So when they shoot up, they picked up us with the light, and they started the shooting. The first cut, what they get, in, I get hit. They hit me my leg. A uh, couple of places. My legs get hit from here down, and I couldn't stand up on it. And uh, I am telling to my friend, Reisner, Reisner, I can't stand on my legs. Would you help me to go try to get to the house? He said to me, you're crazy. How can I help you? 
everyone is going to die here. I can't help you. I can't help myself. And he left me there. So I was staying there. You know, the biggest wound was my knee. And I had to tear my sh shirt and try to clean in the top line that, but I couldn't move. So I would stay there about get completely dark, and I tried to crawling from there. And again, you know, the, the candles went up in the air, and they saw me there, and I got a second time. And they shoot me that time on my arm, my head, and on my back. So I was there. I couldn't move. I was bleeding there, and I left there unconscious. And <coughs> I wake up next couple of hours later probably they were carrying me they carrying me on the stretcher to Paulak they taking me somewhere on that time I have to mention to you I was wearing a Hungarian army uniform what we was taking during the time when we were in the in the guerrillas they were robbing one of the storage place where they had the armies there so they didn't know who I am. They know I had a wearing a uniform, which is not Polish, not not uh, uh, Russian. They know the Germans. That's a Hungarian uniform. So they are carrying me the first state place. They took me a first state place, and the two boys who they are carried the uh, stretcher, they know me, because they were part of a, they are, But they get caught with the uh, Germans, they caught him. And uh, one of them is telling me in my, in my ear, don't worry, Magyar. That's the way the Polak called the Hungarian. Don't worry, Magyar, M-A-G-A. Uh, because we're not going to tell them who you are. So my father was shot. 13 bullets across his body, and he was taken to a German field hospital where a doctor operated on him. And of course, the doctor realized that this guy is Jewish, and he quarantined him away from the other German soldiers in the field hospital. So this doctor not only saved his life by operating on him, but by also keeping him away from the other German soldiers. And this doctor would come once or twice a day and would bring him food and would change his bandages and doctor him back to health. But about a month later, one evening, my father uh, saw the doctor again, and the doctor said, tonight, after dark, you need to crawl out the window and get away from here because we're being shipped back to Germany. The Russian army is going to take over take over the city, and we're being shipped back to Germany. So that night, my father crawled out the window on crutches and started to make his way back to Hungary. The war was coming to an end. And so remember where I left my mom off? She was on that death march. So now we're going to go back to her, and she's going to tell us about how she was liberated. Well, he was, he was working in the factory until March. In March, there was coming the British, and uh, we had to, you know, move from there. I mean, they wanted to take back to Bergen Belgium, so we went on the road to, to walk <laughs> until Bergen Belgium, but Bergen Belgium felt to the English to the British, and they can take there. So we was walking to Bavaria. Walking? For the walking to the mountains. We was walking usually in the, in the night, but sometimes we was walking on the day too. It was snowy and slippery, and through to the mountains that it was terrible. My sister was all the time with me. I was watching her carefully. I was taking care of her how I can. And uh, when we arrived in Dresda station, when we arrived there, there was an air raid. On the Germans, they just 
they just shut, close the doors, and they run to the to the bunkers in Germany. And uh, in the middle of Germany, and uh, we was we was you know praying in this way, con because this you know we was up and down, jumping up and down on the on the the first train, and then we went on the road, and we was going to a, a really wooded area, you know, not I mean not wood, trees area. Both side of the road is trees, and uh, we was going on a friend of ours had an uh, infection in the leg, and uh, we was helping her on the two side on carrying her little bag, and when we test a little boot house on the side, then I went inside and I just pushed them out behind the behind the little building. And we were standing there all away until this whole big transport is passed by. We went in in this village. We just picked up a house and we went in and we asked some food. And there, this lady invited in and gave us some sandwich. And when we left, she gave us a bag cooked potato. potato. And she came out to the door with us, and she told, "This way coming the Ger the the Russians, and this way they coming the Americans." And then I told my sister, "Okay, let's go to America." And we went on this way, and we find three soldiers was coming on the bicycle. So the war was over, and as you can imagine. Everybody wants to get home. There are American soldiers, Russian soldiers, German soldiers, British soldiers, survivors, those few who can still manage to get around on their own. Everybody wants to get home. So my mom had to figure out and get herself back to Hungary, which meant going through Germany, through Austria, sometimes on trains, but there weren't many trains because they were all bombed down sometimes catching a ride, most of the time walking. And when she got back to Hungary, first thing she did was look for family, see who survived, who came back. But she right away sent a telegram to Debertson, where my father was from, because she didn't know whether he's alive or not. She sent a telegram saying, I'm back, come and get me. At the same time, my father was making his way back to Debertson to find what family of his came back. And he found his mom and his sister with a five-year-old who came back. Everybody else was gone, which was really a miracle because usually the older people and the very young did not survive. And he got her telegram. So off he went the next day to Solnok to find her. But when he got her, got there, he she wasn't there. She went on to a different town where other family members used to live. But when she left, she left a note. If Les comes, tell him I went to that town. And when he went to that town, he found another note that said, tell Les I went to this town. So he found that note. And so he followed her notes through all the towns where she used to have family until he finally caught up with her. And they got married the next day, and you saw their picture there in the beginning. So they're trying to put their lives back together again. But in 1949, Hungary became a communist country. So my father said, you know what? I'm done with Hungary. They make terrible decisions. So he and my mom, and by, th by then my two-year-old brother, had to escape Hungary. And it's just like if you've ever seen the movie, The Sound of Music, they had to escape over the border with just whatever belongings they can carry and a two-year-old little boy. They made their way to, Italy, to Austria, then to Italy, and then they made their way to Israel. Israel in 1949 was a brand new country. And guess what's going on there? There's a war going on. 
So the first thing, my father had to get into the military and fight again for the reestablishment of the Jewish homeland. So I was born in Israel, and in 1964, my family moved to the United States. And in 1986, my parents joined me here in Texas. And in this next picture, you can see the family as it has grown since. So with that, I will conclude. And um, I just want to leave you with a message from my father. When he did the recording for this, for his testimony, he said, I want to leave a message to those people who might see this in the future. He said, I want you to know that if you think that something like the Holocaust could never happen again, you're wrong. It can happen, and it can happen so quickly, you don't even realize. He said, and if you think it can't happen here in the United States, you're very wrong. And if you think it can only happen to the Jewish people, he said, you're dead wrong. He said, always pay attention. Look for the signs. Don't be a bystander. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. So uh, the first question from an audience member uh, is, how has being the child of survivors shaped you in your life? Well, <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, it actually shaped my life uh, once my father passed away. Uh, my parents didn't talk about their experiences uh, until they did this testimony. And so, up until then, I really didn't know much of anything about their stories. And when I finally heard it, and my father suddenly passed away, it was like a wake-up call to me, and it t totally changed my life. I knew then that I had to be his voice, and that I had to tell his story and pass it on to make sure that nothing like that can ever happen like again. And I've taught my kids the same thing, that they will carry on. Julie, did your father have lifelong pain from his injuries? Definitely, yes, yes. He, he actually still had about three bullets in his body because uh, they couldn't operate on him. They were in such places that surgery would have been more dangerous. Do your children plan to tell your parents' story, their grandparents' story? Yes, yes. Um, I know for sure my son uh, is planning to continue, and um, my daughter as well, I'm sure she will if she, she has the opportunity. Final question. What inspires you to tell your parents' story? Well, uh, look at current events. And look how, you know, it, it's always in our face um, that we haven't learned the lessons. And it's important to continue to tell the story so that something like this could never happen, not only to the Jewish people, but to any people, to any group. This should not be happening. And unfortunately, it's happening right now. Uh, in different par parts of the world. So we have to continue educating and we have to continue teaching our kids what hate can do. Thank you, Julie. And thank you all so much for joining us to hear uh, Julie Mittal Berman tell her parents Les and Magda Middleman's story. Um, and we will be wrapping up. This was the last of this spring's uh, Survivor Speaker Series talks. So thank you so much. Thank you.